Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he told them, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are worthy of all of our praise and honor, dear Lord. Lord, do open up our ears to hear your word today, Lord, to be Jesus' hands and feet until he returns, to live a life that brings glory and honor patterned after our master and king, Lord, to bow before Jesus Christ today with our lives rather than waiting for that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Lord, help us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but Lord, help us to just have exuberant joy about preaching your gospel message and living a life that brings you glory and honor. Lord, we thank you for our family and friends that are here today and all the blessings that you bestow upon us and the fact that we can come and worship you freely without persecution. Let us not take it for granted, but Lord, but let us use it for our advantage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've entitled this, Jesus' Invitation to You. So I'm going to review a little bit first. Luke chapter 8, and we're going through the Gospel of Luke, so what we've been doing for the first of the year, and I've been dividing that you know, piece by piece and digging into it. In Luke chapter 8, the sower came to sow his seed, and Jesus makes it clear that the seed is the Word of God. And what does the Word of God do? With the power of the Holy Spirit, it convicts hearts of sin if it's planted in good soil. So consider that. What kind of soil has the seed been planted in? Because I know it's been planted because you're here. I've seen your face over and over again. But is it producing a crop? Is, he, is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God softening your heart, transforming you into the image of Christ? Luke 8.15 says the good soil was those uh, with a noble <coughs> excuse me, and good heart who hear the Word, cling to it, and by persevering produce a crop. And just a few verses before this, Jesus has said to, to everyone that had ears to hear, the knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables, so that th though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. And I said to those that were willing to hear, because if you're willing to hear and those seeds have been planted, then you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not taught enough in the church today. So many Christians think, oh, he's a disciple, she's a disciple, God hasn't called me to that. You are all disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, if that seed has been planted in your heart, and you should be producing a crop. The knowledge of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, and as you submit yourself to the king, he will guide you more and more. Jesus said, I am going away, but it is better for you to go away. Because greater things you'll do when the comforter comes, the Holy Spirit comes, to walk alongside of you, to carry out this mission that I have given you, to be not only a friend of Jesus, not only a child of God, but an ambassador who rings out the message to the lost world and to, and to, the, to the kingdom uh, children as well. A few verses later, Jesus' mothers and brothers come to him, and they say, Here, family wants to see you. But he says in verse 21, My mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and carry it out. Are you a hearer only, or are you a hearer and a doer? Are you feeding on Jesus Christ? Are you living for God's will rather than your own will, looking for opportunities to advance the kingdom of God? Because that is your commission as a disciple to teach, to go and make disciples, and to teach them to obey everything that Christ has taught you. So I've got a question for you. There's going to be seven questions. Question number one is, 
Has the seed been planted on the good soil of your heart? This is a question for you. That's a question for me. I examined this as I went through. How is the soil of my heart? Does it need tending? Is there weeds that need to be pull, pulled? Does it need to be aerated? Does it need to be watered? Jesus Christ will do all of those things for you if you let him. Or do times in your life make that soil hard and compact and everything else? Has the seed that has been planted in your heart planted in good soil? Next, after the things that we talked about in Luke chapter 8, Jesus went across the lake and a storm arose. And the disciples were afraid and woke Jesus. And what was his answer to them? Where in the world is your faith? Why do you have such little faith? Why did you get rid of your faith? Where is it gone? Don't you have faith in the troubled times that Jesus Christ will take care of you? If he loved you enough to die for you, if God loved you enough to give his one and only son for you, why do you worry about the things of this world? Why do you fret and why do you not trust to follow after Jesus every step of the way? Jesus rebukes the waves and they're silenced. But Jesus says to his disciples in verse 25, Where is your, your faith? And what is their response to that? Who is this man? It cries out and nature hears him. They've seen every other miracle that he's done and Luke is setting that up in his gospel, the authority of Jesus Christ, who he is. And the reason that he wrote his gospel is so that you, as a follower of Christ, would know what you believe. So there is no doubt. This is your training. You know what you believe so that you will put it into effect. Then he goes on to write the book of Acts, which is the Holy Spirit enabling you and I and everyone else who chose to be a follower of Jesus Christ to live like Christ in this world. And the example set forth in Acts is an amazing example that we hardly see in the church today, especially in the United States, because we don't gather together daily and eat and desire the things that Jesus Christ had to have compassion to feed others enough that we would sell our property so that no one had need in the community of Jesus Christ. We're too caught up in the American dream, which should be that we can freely worship God, but instead it's that we can pursue life and liberty and happiness and get all the things that mean nothing in this world. Because what would it profit a man to gain the whole world, to own everything in the world, but lose his own soul. So I have a second question for you. How is your faith? Is it based totally on Jesus Christ? As we read through Luke chapter 8, we see more examples of faith because Luke has given us those examples so we can understand what true faith looks like when even the disciples, the 12 that have been training with Jesus for two years now, lacked faith and still question, who is this? But yet remember that they've come to follow Jesus. They've given up their careers as fishermen or whatever their, their careers were to follow after Jesus, to be his disciple. You have to put yourself back into the time frame of that. Along comes a man. John the Baptist says, this is the man. He baptizes and there's a word from God from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And we give up everything to follow after the Messiah that has come. Everything. Nothing else matters in our life. But at this point, they're still questioning, who is this man? Why is that? Well, one reason is because, and it's just by our nature, because we're sinful creatures, terribly sinful, and we don't want to see ourselves that way and don't understand the depth and depravity of our sin and the graciousness of salvation. We want a Savior that takes care of our needs the way we want them. We don't want to give up the good things. We think that becoming a Christian costs us something. That's why we read the Scripture this morning. Anyone who gives up anything to follow me will get it abundantly back. Yeah, you might have to walk away from your father or your mother or your brother or your sister, but you'll gain many brothers in Christ that will spend eternity with you. I know that's a hard concept to think of. I think about it with my own family, that if I lost whoever eternally to hell, at least I would have gained other brothers and sisters and children in Christ. And everything that God has given me is a blessing. And I'm accountable for how I respond to those blessings. 
So then in Luke chapter 9, Jesus sends out his 12 disciples. And remember, I just asked you the question, how is your faith? And is it totally based on Jesus? He sends them out. They're trained up. He sends them out and gives them power and authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, that salvation has come. The Messiah is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. And they come back and they've done what Jesus said. With power and authority, they have healed. They have cast out demons. They have preached the kingdom of heaven. And the question comes up from the king, who is Jesus? I know I beheaded John the Baptist. It can't be him. Who is this man named Jesus that I hear about? And I don't only hear about him, I hear about his disciples because they've gone out into the world. I hear about them healing. And I hear about them casting out demons. And I hear them preaching the news of the kingdom of God. But I don't understand this because I want my kingdom. I want my will, my desires. I don't want to bow a knee to the king of kings and lord of lords. So then the day gets late. Jesus tries to spend time with his disciples, but the crowds are pressing in. And there's 5,000 men plus women and children. Who knows, maybe 20,000 men. That said last week that would fill the gorge at a big concert. And they're pressing upon Jesus and it's getting late. And what does disciples say? And I asked you the question again, number two, how is your faith and is it based totally on Jesus? And his disciples say, out of good human knowledge, it's getting late. You need to send them home, Jesus, so they could get some lodging and some food. Well, now, isn't the opposite of faith saying, hey, they're here, Lord, what can we do? Can we provide them lodging? Can we provide them food? Jesus has compassion upon them and doesn't want to send them away. And he says, you feed them. But what am I going to feed them with? I don't have anything. I don't have enough money because I immediately go back to my, my human thought. I don't have enough money. There's not enough here. We couldn't provide enough wages, period, to provide food for these people to even be, have a little, let alone eat to their fill and be satisfied and have an abundance left over. But at least Andrew, and I love Andrew, and I say it every time I mention his name, he goes looking and brings someone to Jesus. But even he says, what can we do with so little? All we have is two fish and five loaves. And that meant little fish and little cakes of bread. Not much. What can we do with so little? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Anything, everything that you might face. And he will multiply as well. So when it's left over, there's 12 baskets full, enough to, for, to provide for the 12 disciples, enough to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> And every person that was there that heard about or maybe even experienced Jesus do a miracle now experienced it as a group of people. 20,000 people seeing the power of Jesus Christ creating out of nothing. If you're into science and stuff, if you, if you looked at E equals MC squared and looked at what kind of energy that would take, it's mind-boggling. I'm not even going to try to tell you what it is. Because Jesus Christ created so much food to feed the crowd, to tell them that it's not all about physical, it's about spiritual. I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me and feeds upon me will have eternal life. They will be satisfied. So the question arises again, who is this Jesus? Everyone at that time in that area was asking the question, who is Jesus? In Matthew, we read the account. If we read it and check, look at the continuity of the Gospels and everything, we'll learn that after this, that Peter walks on water. That Jesus goes out to be alone and Jesus walks on water. But in Matthew's account, we learn that Peter walks on water as well. In Matthew 14, But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of Peter. You of little faith, he said, why do you doubt? And when they had climbed back into the boat, the wind died. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I mean, that's why we're here today in church corporately, because we're professing that Jesus Christ is Lord. But what about personal? 
Because that's where Luke's gospel is. It's personal to see where you're at in this story so far. I can be a part of the crowd that is praising and saying Jesus is, but how am I living? And collectively then, how are we living? Are we living like Christ? Is Jesus my all? Would you be satisfied with daily bread? The, the children of Israel were not satisfied with the manna that came down from heaven. This food that they had no understanding what it was. It was so delicious and so good, but yet they longingly looked back. They weren't satisfied because they wanted something else. If you had nothing else in your life, if you lost everything you had, your riches, your freedom, your family, everything else, would Jesus Christ be enough? And not only enough, but would he be enough to be satisfied and have an abundance left over to carry you through the storm that happens tomorrow? Is Jesus your everything? Are you feeding on him? Jesus also fed 4,000 on the other side of the lake. We, we, we talked about that. And he had seven baskets full, seven a number of completion that he was going to bring the, the Gentile world, that Jesus Christ is the salvation for every man. He also warned about the leaven of the Pharisees, and the disciples still did not understand. They thought he was talking about physical bread again. But this whole passage is to teach us with things in the physical, the heavens declare the glory of God, that we see the spiritual. But Paul tells us that we fight a spiritual battle. We fight it constantly, but we're given the armor of God that will quench every fiery dart of the devil. Do you realize this? How is your faith? Is it totally based upon Jesus Christ? 100%. John in his gospel adds a huge account here the day after the feeding of the 5,000. The day after all of these people recognize and see Jesus Christ do this miracle on the next day. Jesus says, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am living water. I am the bread of life. But many find this teaching hard they don't understand it. And even disciples, and I was right, I checked myself. It is John 6, verse 66. Even disciples turn away from that point. Again, let me remind you, disciples are men and women who have given up this world to follow after Jesus, to be trained and to be like Him. Not some casual follower. They're the ones that have been going to church their whole life and turn away at this point because they say, I can't feed on just Jesus. I have to have all these other things. He is not enough to satisfy me. I don't understand the depravity of my sin, the debt that I cannot pay. And I don't understand the gracious gift that God our Father has given to us in spite of us being enemies. Who is this Jesus? Now is a pivotal time in Luke's gospel, and it's a pivotal time when you read this, these verses in Mark and when you read them in Matthew. Now is the pivotal time for you to decide, am I going to be a true follower of Jesus Christ or a so-called follower? Am I going to be sold out or am I going to be a fan? Because you must, must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus. A disciple who does not is not a disciple and will not see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus goes on to say that in Luke in a few chapters. So question number three, is Jesus your bread of life? Are you feeding on him? Is he sustaining you? Is he enough? I remind you again, most disciples that day to the point where Jesus even asked the twelve, are you going to turn back also? They had every intent of following Jesus, but they turned back that way, that day. They turned back from the way, the truth, and the life. Why? How? Did you not see the signs? Did you not see the miraculous wonders? It was just the day before that Jesus miraculously fed 20,000 people. But on the next day when he says, follow me only, get every bit of your substance for life here and now and for life eternal off of me. It's not just life eternal, it's life abundantly now. 
that you don't live for the same things before, that you now you honor God because of the gift that He's given you with all that you have, because all that you have to give is your life. Salvation is free. It's by faith alone. But Jesus said to consider the cost. It's not something you just say, I have decided to follow Jesus and don't do and say, I have a Savior and I'll be fine one day. Either you have decided to follow Jesus or you haven't. And if you have, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross and you must follow after Him. You must feed on Him, as Jesus says in, in John's Gospel, and drink of His blood. And that's not talking about communion. That's talking about the way of life. Jesus has not gone to the cross yet. When He makes this statement here, He, didn't say, he said He's going to die. He gives His first prediction after, G, after Peter's de declaration of who He is. And then don't forget, right after Peter declares that, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and Jesus says, this came from your, your Father who is in heaven. Right after that, Jesus had to say, hey, get behind me, Satan. Because he said, no way are we going to let you die. Jesus says, I'm going to suffer and die. He did not tell him he was going to die on a cross. But he tells them, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross. That's marching to the death, being ridiculed, being persecuted and put to death by a foreign government. Treated as though you weren't even a human being for the gospel's sake and for the name of Jesus Christ. And after you take up your cross, you can follow me because then there won't be any other thing standing in the way. You'll be loving your Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. So I want to read a little bit from John chapter 6 and I'm, not, I'm going to try not to get stuck there if you want to turn there, John, so I don't spend too much time because I'm preaching over Luke, not John. But I want you to hear these words before we go back to Luke. Truly, truly, I tell you, John 6, verse 26. Truly, truly, verily, verily. Listen up, listen up. That's what this means. It is not because you saw these signs that you are looking for me, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. It's not about physical, but you only realize it's about physical. You got your tummies fed and you were satisfied and you ate to abundance till you were stuffed and there was some left over and you backed yourself away from the table and said, this is good. Verse 27, do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life. Do you not realize you have a soul? It's not about here, today, gone tomorrow. It's about tomorrow, guys. And it is about that I'm here today, so I better do something about tomorrow because I don't know when my life will be required of me. And I won't, don't want to be labeled as a fool. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him God the Father has placed His seal of approval. Then they inquired, What must we do to perform the works of God? Of course I want to sign up for this. Jesus replied, The work of God is this, to believe in the One who sent me. That's it. Salvation by faith, through grace. Not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. But you've got to accept that gift of God and not put it up on the shelf, but use that gift. And the gift is the Holy Spirit, God living inside of you. You are a temple. You are a priesthood. You are a priest, a part of a royal priesthood, preaching the gospel message that salvation has come. So I cannot live the same. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. The new has come. Do you believe this? You can't go back to the way you were and believe this. That's all you have to do is simply believe. Verse 30, so they asked him, what sign then will you perform? Really, you just did the multiplication of fish and loaves yesterday and, and fed the masses and you want to perform another sign to prove this? No, you don't. You don't want to come. You want more and more and more proof. What will be enough proof? What will be enough family? What will be enough friends? What will be enough job? What will be enough health? What will be enough in this world? Only Jesus Christ is enough. Are you feeding upon Him? Our fathers, verse 31, ate manna in the wilderness. As is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're, they're so silly here. They're, they're answering their own questions, but they don't understand it. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I tell you, listen up here. It was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. 
which He's already said He is giving you now in me. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us this bread all the time. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Three times He said, eat from me. I am the bread that sustains you. If you want to use Moses as an example, He points to me. But what happened in the wilderness again? You longingly look back. And that generation did not enter the promised land. That's incredible. Think about it again a minute. That whole generation died. I don't know how many millions that might have been. I can't fathom that. But God is gracious. He didn't assign them to not enter in the promised land. He wanted them to enter the promised land, but they longingly looked back. But at least God is gracious enough that He left the promised land open to their children. Only two men said, hey, we can go conquer the giants in that land because we have God with us. And they didn't know Him in the face of Jesus Christ. Now the disciples are seeing God in the flesh, seeing all the miracles that He's done. But when He says, I'm the bread of life, they don't want that. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. But as I stated, you have seen me and still you do not believe. Every one the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me will never, he will never, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, why? Not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Now, if God's only Son can do that, why can't we? Why can't I? I need to put it more personal than that. And I can't on my own, so I have to die to myself. I have to deny myself, die to myself, so that I can follow Jesus. And know that He is enough. And know that I can never pay the debt of my sins. And to know that this gift is so, so gracious. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I shall lose none of these that He has given me, but raise them up on the last day. There's that promise for us. Verse 40. For it is my Father's will that everyone who looks to the Son of Man and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Verse 41, At this the Jews began to grumble about Jesus because He had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were asking, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How then can He say, I have come down from heaven? with everything that Jesus had done, with the disciples, besides the crowds that had said, I believe and I'm following after Him, when Jesus makes this statement that I am the bread of life and you have to feed off me, they don't want to hear that. Because I've got my own agendas, I've got my own plans, I've got my own desires. Does that mean that you need to kill all of them when you come to Jesus? I'm going to say something you don't want to hear, but yes. Yes. That doesn't mean your dreams and desires still won't happen. That doesn't mean you don't get married, you don't have a family, and you don't have a house with a white picket fence in this country. I thought that's not really probably the dream anymore. <laughs> not that that was a good dream or a bad dream. It just means that whatever you give me, God, is a blessing, and I will use it to your glory and honor, and you come first, King Jesus. My allegiance is to you. And whatever that means, if I have to leave father or mother or son, I am willing because I don't have a problem there where my allegiance falls. It falls with you only. Jesus in verse 43 says, Stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent, sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from Him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. Listen up. Truly, truly, I tell you, verily, verily, he who believes has eternal life. John's writing here is so clear in what Jesus says, and he says it over and over again to listen up at this point. I am the bread of life, verse 48. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. 
and this bread which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Verse 52, at this the Jews began to argue among themselves, how can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, again, truly, truly, listen up. Unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Again, I'm going to say, but not get on a rabbit trail. This is not talking about communion. It hadn't been instituted yet. It's talking about Jesus is going to give his body and pour out his life blood to save you. You need to eat of that so that you will follow after me as a disciple and do the same so that salvation will come not only to Israel but to the whole world and there will be enough left over of the bread of life to feed them and to feed your children and your grandchildren and your grandchildren. So are you feeding so you can feed them? Verse 55, For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father has sent me and I live because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will live because of me. From the point they start feeding till, oh, there's no ending, is there? That's what eternity is. Once you start feeding, feeding and are satisfied, you will be with Jesus Christ forever and ever. You don't see his face today, but you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and one day you'll meet him face to face. And he will either say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant, or as Scripture says, he doesn't say that he's going to say this literally, but I'm going to put it this way at this point, I'm ashamed of you. You knew my commands, and you did not do them. For whoever is ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, I will be ashamed of them before the Father and the holy angels. That means it's a proclamation when you read it that way. That means when Jesus Christ's Son, God's going to say, What about Alan? And I'm going to hear the statement either, Well done, my good and faithful servant, or I am ashamed of you away from me. And there is going to be no, but Lord, Lord, we did mighty de deeds in your name. It's simply going to be away from me. I did not know you. That's the choice that you're facing. So have you decided, truly decided, to follow after Jesus, to eat his flesh and to eat his blood? Verse 59, Jesus said this while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a difficult teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this teaching, Jesus asked them, Does this offend you? Then what will happen when you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. He makes it clear again, you better not be thinking about the things that are physical. You better be thinking about spiritual. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. However, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. Then Jesus said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has granted it to him. Verse 66. From that time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. I don't know if you think about it when you read that and everything. If you think strictly about how could those guys do that? But God in the flesh as a human being and God incarnate watched these people walk away from salvation. How tragic. Is it a burden on your heart? I can't imagine how much Scripture doesn't give those two words at this point about Jesus wept, but I can't imagine the sorrow and betrayal and everything that he felt. Because you came so eagerly to want to know him, to be associated with him, but when it meant, hey, if you believe, then put me as king. No, I don't want to do that. What you're going to do for me is not worth that. I'm not satisfied with salvation alone and what you're offering me. Question number four. Do Jesus' teachings, commands, we'll put them that way, do they offend you? He had to ask the disciples of that that day. Do they offend you? Does that offend you to turn your other cheek? <laughs> or whatever it is in the Bible, that, that scripture that, that you read and like... Mm -hmm. 
Do you try to obey all of Jesus' teachings so that you're a true follower? Even that one. The next thing recorded in John's gospel is, Jesus, is Peter's confession to who he is. So I ask you again, who is Jesus to you? In Luke's gospel, right after the 5,000, we don't have these other things. That's why I put them in there. Because Luke is writing this orderly account. You know what you believe. John writes his gospel so that you will believe. Jesus presents the miracle feeding and asks Peter who the, asked them who he says, who people say he is, and then uh, the disciples specifically, and Peter declares that he is the Son of God. That is what happens right in our chapter of Luke next. So Luke 9, verse 18. I'm going back to Luke. One day as Jesus was praying in private, we see all these other things had happened, and the disciples were with him. He questioned them. Who do the crowd say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that a prophet of old is risen. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Question number five. Are you ready to follow? Because this is the point you're at. Peter has made the proclamation. Are you ready to follow are you ready to make that decision? Jesus has given you an invitation. That is the title of my sermon. Will you follow me? That's the invitation, plain and simple. And Luke has presented all this, and you've said it from the beginning that you are in Luke's gospel, but he's presenting it to you so you know what that means, and there's going to be a lot of parables from this point of further teaching illustrations. Are you ready to follow Jesus Christ he is the only way, the only truth, the only life. He will give you life abundant now and eternal life later. Is it worth following Jesus, yes or no? So what would you expect Jesus' words next to be in the Gospel of Luke? Well, come follow me and we'll all have a good time together and you'll have eternal life. No. No. Let's read on. Verse 21. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone because he wasn't ready for that to be spread everywhere yet. we we'll get into more details later on that. But here's what he says. Here's his words. The Son of Man must suffer many things. He must be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And I've reminded you that Peter then says no way. Well, why does Peter say no way? Because Peter said, you're the Christ. I have decided to follow you. Let's go. Okay, I'm going to suffer and die. Well, wait a minute. And I didn't mean to fall, but that looks even better. <laughs> that's not what I expected you to say, Jesus. But that's exactly what he does say. If you're ready to follow me, then deny everything that you thought before. Every bit of it. There's no limitation on it. Deny it all. I didn't say get rid of your children that you had, your wife that you had. I didn't say anything like that, so don't take my words out of context. But deny everything that you thought was important for the kingdom, for Jesus. Those things that you think are important, Jesus thinks are too, okay? But he doesn't want you worshiping them more than him. Then take up that cross, a Roman uh, instrument of suffering and death that no one came back from that was horrific that most people went to naked beaten and everybody saw him carrying that cross up to the hill and knew exactly what was happening to that man he's a dead man walking and follow me no wonder Peter would say oh no way is this happening verse 23 then Jesus said to all of them notice that Luke puts that in there this is not just to the twelve this is to everyone that's why I started off with if you want to call yourself a Christian you better call yourself a disciple first if anyone wants to come after me to arise and to come up to the, to the, the call to be established firm and grounded and follow if anyone wants to come after me he must, not he might, not he should, he must deny himself, self-denial. When I say it that way, does it sound a little different? To me, it sounds a little har more harsh. But that's exactly what it means, that I need to be, have a life of self-denial. To separate myself, to refuse to put myself and my will first. 
because of the desire of another that is greater. Not just sinful things, as I said. Not that I just need to clean up the pornography in my life and the lying and the stealing in my life and all these things. No, that I need to give my son to you, that I need to give my job to you, whatever that looks like. My future, my everything. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me. He must deny himself, take up his cross, and Luke adds a word in daily. And I think I've kind of painted the picture of the cross, and I want to remind you again that Jesus hadn't said he was going to have a cross. And follow me. Verse 24, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet lose or forfeit his very self. Whoever wants to have life now and forevermore will lose their life now, their dreams, their desires, everything else. He's saying the same thing, but saying it differently. And he's saying, but the complete opposite, whoever does lose their life for themselves will save it now and forevermore. And then he goes on to say, like I said, what would it profit you? Because your pride, your greed, the things that you think you don't have are what keeps you from submitting to someone else, especially the king of kings. Because you say, it's not time because I, I want to spend this time with my family. It's not time because I don't have retirement built up. It's not time because I do have a job or responsibility. Whatever it is, how much will be enough? Does Jesus totally satisfy you? Will you take yourself off the throne so you can put him on the throne? What if you could gain everything? The most powerful human being in the world and everyone else bowed down to you because you owned everything. What would that profit you? What would you gain from it? You would still die and be dead in your trespasses and sin. It's not even possible to gain everything. There are some rich, absorbently rich people and everything who can do anything they want to in this world, but no one could ever even conceivably gain the whole world. But even if you could, would it be to your advantage? Would it profit you anything? So why chase after those things? Why worry about what you're going to be fed or what you're going to wear? Doesn't God provide for the fields, the flowers in the field and the birds of the air? Verse 26, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. If you're not proclaiming Jesus now, why? You hate saying that word ashamed. You hate saying you have pride. But if you're not taking every opportunity to proclaim him now, why is it? Are you ashamed? Because if you're ashamed, he's going to be ashamed of you. <clears throat> From Matthew 16, we get a little more of the account of what's going on, and I'll put that in here again. But I want to remind you, Jesus has called you to give up everything, to suffer and be humiliated and die to yourself, and possibly that in this world so that you'll follow him if you haven't read it read The Cost of Discipleship by Bonhoeffer or read Mere Christianity by Lewis they some, say some of these same things that you have chosen to die to this world and everyone who chooses Christ decides that or they don't and they don't belong to Christ this is where we're at in this scripture do you understand this? Because many, many Christians do not understand the cost and the call. In Matthew 16, verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he questioned his disciples, Who do you say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, Jesus asked, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. That means if you proclaim that Jesus Christ is your Savior, your Lord, your Messiah, the Christ, if you believe this, this came from heaven. This came from God. These are His words to you that He's revealed to you. Come, follow me. And I tell you that you, Peter, and on you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he admonished the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must, just like you must, that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hand of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and that he must be killed. And on the third day be raised back to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. That's the same words that Jesus used to rebuke the winds and the waves and to rebuke the demons. Far be it from you, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said, and Mark says he turned and rebuked Peter right back, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Now, I'll put my explanation on that. One minute I'm proclaiming Jesus Christ, but the next minute, because of the things I say and the things I do, I'm living for Satan. Peter did it. I can definitely say that I do it. He walked with Jesus for two years. He was a spokesperson. He walked on water. And one minute he's proclaiming Jesus Christ, but the next way he's not living like Jesus Christ. He's not living a life of faith. And what it says right here is, you are a stumbling block to me. You stumble people coming to me and hearing my gospel. For you don't have the things of God in your mind, but the things of man. So I need to pray for the mindset of Jesus Christ so that it will control my mouth and my actions. Then Jesus told his disciples, verse 24, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Those same words that we are reading in Luke and in Mark here. What will it profit if a man gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? He adds that statement in there in Matthew. What can you give then to save yourself? If you gain the whole world... Can that be payment to God? <laughs> I smirked if you didn't hear that. You can't pay anything to God for your salvation, but it's a free gift. Will you come and follow after Jesus? Do you believe? <clears throat> Verse 27, For the Son of Man will come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will repay each one according to what He's done. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 28, Truly, truly, I tell you, listen up, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Mark's account in verse Chapter 8, verse 36, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange of his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, you do realize we still live in an adulterous and sinful generation, don't you? That's all about me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity as I call it, instead of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit living in you, transforming you into the image of Christ. The Son of Man will also be ashamed of Him when He comes in His Father's glory with His holy angels. Question six. Are you following Jesus? Is He leading you? You've got to be feeding on Him. You've got to be walking in step with the Spirit if, if you're following Him to where He wants you to go. If you have no idea where He wants you to go at all, you're not feeding, you're not studying God's Word, you're not praying for what the next steps are. You're just guiding the steps of your path like a fool instead of following God's path because Jesus is the way. John the Baptist said He would make crooked paths straight and draw sons back to their fathers. Are you denying yourself, your desires, your wills, your dreams, even the good ones, in exchange for being a disciple of Jesus Christ? There is nothing good about a sinful human being, including myself. 
nothing, no righteousness found in me at all. I have to shed everything aside and put on Jesus Christ. I deserve God's wrath, but Jesus took it willingly and joyfully for me. He suffered and died. Why in the world would I not want to follow him? No, I don't want to suffer and die. But I want that gift of salvation for the depravity of my sins. I want it every day. I want to take up my cross every day, whatever that looks like, because I don't want a day to be there when I'm not bowing to the King of Kings and I'm bowing to Satan instead. So I do like Luke's version of putting in the word daily. Do you believe? Are you denying yourself, taking up your cross daily and following after Jesus because His words lead to eternal life? C.S. Lewis wrote this, and I mentioned it earlier, from Mere Christianity. It's the eighth chapter. It's called The Great Sin. The vice I'm talking about, and I'm just going to read a few little excerpts. The vice I'm talking of is pride or self-conceit. That's the opposite of self-denial. And the virtue opposite to it is called humility, because I can humble myself so that I can deny myself. Pride is the complete anti-God state of mind. It's what brought heaven, uh, brought uh, the devil out of heaven. Pride is essentially competitive, if you haven't thought about it that way. The proud man, even when he has got more than he can possibly want, will still try to get more. What does it profit you if you gain the whole world? If I'm a proud man, then as long as there is one man in the world more powerful or richer or clever than I, he is my rival, he is my enemy. Jesus has all power and all authority and He's given it to you. Are you bucking that power or are you taking that and saying, yes, Lord? Pride always means enmity. It is enmity. And not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. In God you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know... God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of, of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see the one above. Wow. That raises a terrible question. How is it that people who are quite obviously eaten up with pride can say to themselves they believe in God and appear to be religious. I'm afraid it means that they are worshiping an imaginary God, one they've made in their image, a graven image instead of God. Because God's image came in flesh, you know Him as Jesus Christ. Is He your Savior? I suppose it was on those people Christ was thinking when He said, that some would preach about him and cast out devils in his name, only to be to told at the end of the world that he never knew them. The real test of being in the presence of God is that you either yourself altogether deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus or not. Question number seven. Sherry, can you hand those out? Huh? What? As soon as I write the question down. Oh, I, now I understand what she said. I, she always says, I say, huh, huh, huh. <laughs> this question is, what will you do with Jesus' invitation to you? Because that's what this is all about. That's what the title is. His invitations to the world, yes, but let's put it bluntly here. I am worried about you. And I know Paul said he would give up all things if the Jewish nation could come to salvation. But right now I've got to make myself right with God. I've got to decide if I am going to follow Jesus or I'm the blind leading the blind and we will both fall into a pit. So the first thing I've got to do is decide if I'm going to follow Jesus. It really doesn't matter at this point if you are or not. 
don't take me wrong again, and I'm not downcasting that. But I've got to decide if I am following Jesus. So question number seven is, what will you do with Jesus' invitation to you? I'm serious. His invitation to the disciples was, now that you realize I'm the Son of God, and even though you've said, I'm not going to suffer and die, I've already told you that I must suffer and die. The Old Scripture, Old Testament and the Scriptures uh, and the prophets all point to this. Will you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me? You must do that. If you do not do that, I will be ashamed of you when I come. And what would it profit the whole, you to gain the whole world and let yet lose your own soul? Logan, can you play that song? Open up your invitations. This is the closing. You do what, it, what you will. This is Jesus' invitation to you. This is not my words. Jesus has given you an invitation, and I gave it to you physically so you could see it. And after this song Must is over, we're going to sing this Jesus bear in a little bit. The cross alone and all the world go free. No, there's a cross for cross for me. The consecrated cross I'll bear till death shall set me free. Upon the crystal pavement, down at Jesus' pierced feet, joyful I'll cast my golden crown, and his dear name repeat. Oh, precious cross, oh, glory. Oh!